Good morning. Uh, I'm very sorry that we've been just a little late uh, in starting this morning. Um, and I'm particularly sorry to our, our first witness, Leslie McAvoy, uh, that that should be so, because I, I know that she's been waiting to, to start. The, the reason uh, and is simply that uh, in order to live stream, which is what we've been doing, as you may know, uh, involves quite a lot of technological expertise, which is way beyond me. Um, but occasionally, uh, there may be a problem, and there's been a problem this morning, uh, that one of the links isn't quite working. What we will be doing is we will be recording what is being shown and said to you, uh, but it won't be out uh, in, the, in the wider world. Uh, you're privileged, if you like, in hearing it um, when no one else does. But uh, so that's the reason we've been trying to sort it out, uh, and it will be sorted out, I hope, sometime during the morning. And after that, it'll be service as usual. That's a long-winded introduction. We're ready for our first witness, who wishes to be known as... As Leslie. So I should just say, before Leslie goes into the, the witness box, that um, the recording of, of the evidence will be uploaded onto the inquiry website. Uh, so although people can't watch the live transmission currently this morning, the evidence will be publicly accessible as usual as soon as it can be uploaded. Yes, thank you. Leslie. <coughs> Please state your full name. Leslie Ann McAvoy. Hold the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Leslie, in late 1985, you were pregnant with your first child uh, and you were admitted to the local maternity hospital. Yes. Can you tell us what happened? Um, the, my baby was due on the, around the 26th of November, um, but around about the 20th, 21st of November, I started to get pain and uh, I was generally unwell, so they admitted me early. Um, and... I started to, my water started to break um, about the 22nd, 21st, 22nd, um, and they induced labour. Uh, and you uh, had a very long labour. Your son was uh, born after about 15 hours. Um, but you were hemorrhaging, but it wasn't <coughs> realised to start with quite how much blood you'd lost. Is that right? That's right. Because it went on for so long, a couple of shift changes... And it was a very slow trickle, we found out later. So the blood loss was very slow and steady, but over a long period of time. Um, so he was born on the 23rd, and, um, and I was exhausted because it had been quite a long labour. And I wasn't recovering as quickly as the other women on the ward, so they were up and about within a few hours and feeding their baby and bathing their baby. And I couldn't do that. I was really ill and felt my limbs felt very leaden and I was very fatigued. And they were kind of chivying me along to, you know, get up and look after my baby and, and I couldn't. And then they took blood samples, but I think it was over a weekend because in those days the lab would close and you'd have to wait for the lab to open. It wasn't 24 hours. And they came to me and said... Um, about the night of the 24th or 5th, they came to me and said, the reason for the lethargy and the reason you can't get up and about is because you're, you've lost so much blood, you need a blood transfusion. And they said that if um, your haemoglobin levels dropped to below 8, you were at risk of a heart attack. And mine were hovering just on 8. So they said it, it was quite urgent that I had a blood transfusion. Um, and you know it must have been before the the twenty. It was around about the twenty third, twenty fourth. Um, what was your reaction um, when it, you were told that you, they thought you needed a blood transfusion? 
I was resistant to it because it was in the 80s and the world was becoming aware of HIV and we had the big tombstone adverts on the TV saying what a death sentence it was and all the rest of it. And there was a lot of publicity at the time saying that blood products and blood was, was infected with <coughs> HIV. So I knew that it was risky and I didn't want the blood transfusion. So I held off um, and refused it. And there was no Google then, so you couldn't kind of look it up. But people were saying, well, you know, if you lose a certain amount of blood, your body can replace it over a few days. And I was kind of hoping my hemoglobin levels would increase slowly, but they were too low and I wasn't replacing the blood myself. So I said I didn't want the blood. Um, Did you tell the doctors why, what your concerns were? Yes, I told them that I was worried about HIV, that I knew some of the blood supplies were infected or weren't safe, and that's why I didn't want the blood. And they, they reassured me and said that I was overreacting, that, that I was being paranoid, <laughs> that the blood was perfectly safe, but I, I still resisted. My father had the same blood group as me, and he offered to donate blood so that I could have safe blood. But they said, well, the system, ironically, they said the system's not set up to take blood from an individual because it has to be screened. <laughs> um, and also um, that I needed more than one unit and you can only donate one unit and then you have to wait six months or whatever. So they couldn't take enough from him. Um, and a consultant, they, they were getting quite irritated by the fact that I wouldn't just accept the blood. And a, a consultant came onto the ward and shouted at me in front of everybody and said I was a bed blocker. And he said, this is a maternity unit. You've had your baby and we should be moving you off this unit. But because you need the blood, we can't because you're too ill to move. But you're, you're blocking a valuable bed. And he, he absolutely humiliated me in front of everyone on the ward. And I was devastated. I was in tears. And he just said, just take the blood. You're being paranoid. Your fears are groundless. You're a you know, silly woman kind of thing. Um, and I rang my father that night in tears and just said, I, I really don't know what to do. And the consultant said, you're more likely to die if you don't have the blood and then you're leaving your baby without a mother. So if you're any kind of a mother, just have the blood. Um, so in the end, I, was, I didn't know what to do. And a, a young doctor, a junior doctor, came onto the ward later that night and said, look, I, I understand what you're worried about. Um, he said, some of the blood is being heat treated. And if the blood is heat treated, it will kill the HIV virus. So he said, if I can guarantee you that the blood you get has been heat treated, will you accept it? And I said, OK, because I thought that was the best I was going to get. So the following morning, which was my birthday, the 26th of November, I was due to have the transfusion in the morning. And this same junior doctor, he stayed on after his shift had finished. And he came to me and he, he, he brought the bags of blood and they were cold, they were straight out of the fridge. And he held them up and there was a sticker. I remember it distinctly. There was a sticker on the bag and it said, heat treated. And he said, look, the blood's from Seacroft. There was a, a label on it. And he said, it's been heat treated. Will you accept it? And I said, yes. And that morning at half past 10, I, I had two litres of blood. And I know that at 10.30 on the 26th of November 1985 is when I was infected with hep C. But obviously we didn't know that at the time. Can I just ask you a little more about the blood bags? Um, um, can you recall anything at all about what they looked like? Was, was, was what you were being shown red blood, as far yes. as you could tell? It was, it was a bag of red blood, just like you see. Um, it, it had Seacroft, um, a label for Seacroft blood bank on it in Leeds. And then there was another sticker, which had obviously been put on manually, that said heat treated. And I remember those bags of blood distinctly because they were really, really cold. And when the nurses came to give me the transfusion, they said, it's going to be better if these are body temperature. So they put one under each arm. So I was sitting there with two bags of blood under my arms to warm them up before I had them. So, I, yeah, I recall them vividly. Um, we'll just look at one document, Leslie. It's 1934002, please, Paul. 
uh, and this is a letter um, uh, dated a few days after uh, um, the events that you're describing. Um, and if we look at the second page, top of the page, we can see in the second line, she was transfused with two units of blood. And that's the contemporaneous record of the blood transfusion that you received at that time. Yeah. The, um, you, you then left hospital. Um, you've explained in your statement that for the following few years until you had your second child, you continued to donate blood. You, you'd um, been a blood donor before. Yeah, I'd been a blood donor before. Obviously, when you first have a baby, you can't give blood straight away. But the minute uh, I was able to, I went back to giving blood. And with hindsight, looking back on that, obviously, I put infected blood back into the system. I didn't know, obviously, but I have to live with that. Um, when my second son was born three years, nine months later... Um, I never quite got back into giving blood. I was too busy. I had two young children and life got in the way, but I'm thankful really that I didn't. And you said in your statement, you have to live with the guilt that you unknowingly put infected blood back into the system. Yeah. You um, have told us that you were reassured that this was safe blood because it had been heat treated and the reassurance was designed to make you... Um, uh, uh, feel safe in terms of any risk of HIV. Yeah. Were you given any advice or warnings or information as to whether there was any risk in relation to hepatitis or any other virus? No. HIV was the only one that we were that I was aware of because of the adverts. Um, I'd never heard of hepatitis C being in the blood. I had my transfusion and got on with my life. Now, it was over 20 years before... Um, you found out that you'd been infected with hepatitis C. Uh, you experienced over a number of years symptoms that you now understand to have been caused by your hepatitis C, but didn't realise that at the time. What, what kind of symptoms were you experiencing and what kind of medical assistance did you seek? Well, I was self-employed uh, and I'd been self-employed for quite a number of years and I was running a training company. Um, it was really successful. It was a limited company. I had 20 trainers on the books. Um, my job involved standing and delivering training in the corporate world. And I was busy. I had two young children. I was traveling a lot. Um, but around about 2004, three, four, I started to get really ill. And um, the first symptom that I remember was crashing fatigue fatigue unlike anything I'd ever experienced before and I think if you've got a busy life and you've had young children you know what that kind of fatigue is and this was worse um, and it was getting in the way of the day job because typically I would get up early you know five o'clock four o'clock if, if the training was in the UK I'd usually drive because I carry a lot of kit so it was easier to load the car up and drive I could be driving four hours, five hours to a client and then deliver a day's training on my feet all day, sometimes two days, stay over in a hotel. At the end of the training then I'd drive home, but it was getting to the point I could sleep for 12 hours and wake up unrefreshed and feel exhausted, even though I'd slept the clock round. By three o'clock in the afternoon, I was really struggling to keep going and, and deliver the training. It affected, I was noticing cognitive differences and I was struggling to run a course for eight hours um, and remember, you know, what I should be doing. And I was losing words sometimes. Um, I knew it wasn't right. Then other symptoms started to appear, mainly um, joint pain, really bad pain in my fingers, my, my feet, my legs all over pain, uh, headaches. So I was going to the, the GP with a variety of, of symptoms that seemed unconnected, and they diagnosed that I had high blood pressure, which they put down to being a businesswoman, busy, young children. My mother was getting elderly at the time, my parents, so I was looking after them as well. Um, and they tested for various things. I mean, they, they were very keen to put a label on what ailed me. 
but everything they came up with didn't resonate with me. So they were testing for things and they kept saying, you know, you're just busy, you're run down, you're tired. And that went on from 2004 continually um, till late 2006, near Christmas 2006. And I'd been going back constantly saying there is something seriously wrong. I started to get uh, pain under my ribs. They were putting that down to maybe gallstones or kidney stones. They were sending me for ultrasound scans. I had just about every test you can think of. They even at one point gave me a brain scan, probably just to see if I was you know, sane by that point. Um, and everything was coming back fine, apart from high blood pressure. And I remember going to the GP finally near December 2006 and it was a young locum GP who I'd not seen before. And when I walked in, she didn't even look, look up from the screen. I think she saw this scroll of ailments coming up, kind of rolled her eyes and said, I think you're depressed. I think this is all in your head. And I said, well, I'm a psychotherapist. And I'm not depressed, but I'm fast getting there. I said, but that's not what this is. And she said, I can offer you antidepressants or nothing. And dismissed me, basically. And I said, well, then it's nothing. And I walked out of there and I sat in the car. My husband at the time was working in Canada. And I rang him and I said, I'm getting nowhere. And the day job was becoming almost impossible by then. And she also said to me, do you just want a sick note? Is that what this is all about? And I said, well, I'm self-employed, so sick note is worth nothing to me. I don't get sick pay or holiday pay. That's why I keep working throughout all this. So I was really desperate. I couldn't do the day job. I was the major breadwinner. You know, it wasn't a small amount of money I was bringing in with the company that we had. Plus, other people's livelihoods kind of depended on me to keep going. But I couldn't, and I just knew I was getting to the point where I physically couldn't do the job. The pain was too bad, the fatigue was too bad. And in February 2007, um, you got into your car and you put the radio on. And, and what is it, or who was it that you heard talking? Well, at the end of 2006, we kind of decided that I'd take some time out, uh, try and put the business on hold for a while until we could get to the bottom of it. So we were lining up to go for private tests and screenings and see if we could find out whatever it was. So I'd taken the Christmas off and it was February and I'd walked the dog and I got in the car and I put the radio on and it was Radio 4, Woman's Hour, because I'm old, I listen to Radio 4. And um, it was Anita Roddick from The Body Shop and she was coming out, if you like, that day to tell the world that she'd just been diagnosed with hepatitis C and I sat and I listened and at first the only reason I was listening is she was a businesswoman that I admired um, and I was quite shocked at what she was saying and she said that she'd had a her daughter in 1985 and she'd had a, a blood transfusion after the birth of her daughter and that resonated because that was the same year I'd had mine and she said for 20 odd years She'd been unaware that she had hepatitis C from infected blood. And then it was discovered with a routine blood test that she'd had for insurance to travel overseas. And she was talking about her symptoms. And I sat and I listened and I thought, that's me. She's talking about me. She's, she's listing all my symptoms. And she recounted the same story that she'd gone for checkups and she'd been to the GP and they had not found anything and she'd put it down to the fact that she was just busy and travelling a lot. But by the time, because she'd had it for 20 odd years and she was a social drinker, she'd have a glass of wine and at dinner and that kind of thing, she'd actually been told that her liver was already cirrhotic and that the treatment that was available wasn't open to her because she was too ill to treat. And my heart, sank and I thought that's going to be me so I for a couple of hours I tried to unknow what I'd just heard but you can't unknow 
So I rang the doctor and said, and I made an appointment, and I walked in to see my usual GP, who probably was rolling his eyes at me again being there. And I said, I want a hepatitis C test. And he said, why? You've got no um, risky factors. You've never used drugs. You've never had medical or dental treatment overseas. You've got no piercings and no tattoos, thankfully. Otherwise, they might have put it down to that. So you've got no risk factors. And I said, well, I had a blood transfusion in 1985 and his face kind of paled and he said, but it's not on your medical record. It's not on the computer. And I said, well, you know, it's there, it's, it's happened. And he said, well, the only thing I can imagine is it's in paper-based records, but because it's over 20 years, they've not been put onto the computer. So it never flagged up. And... And I said, surely when you did whole blood tests, all these blood tests that I've had, surely it would have shown up. And he said, no, because unless you have a, a risk factor that flags it, we don't test routinely for HIV or hepatitis C. So he said, we, we have to do a specific test for that. And he said, first of all, we'll send off a antibody test because that's the cheaper test to do. And if that comes back antibody positive, then we'll do the full hep C test. But he said, it probably won't. You're probably fine. But I kind of knew by then that it wouldn't be. And you had to wait 10 days between the two tests. Yeah, he said it'll take 10 days for the antibody test to come back. And you now had the power of Google. And I now had the research. power of Google. So like everyone else, I went on to Google uh, and researched it, which doctors must love. And... Um, the more I read, the more I knew that that test was going to come back positive. And it was the worst 10 days of my life. And I remember it was actually a couple of days early than the 10 days. I was in the kitchen, I was cooking tea, and it was a real flashbulb moment. I think the most momentous moments in your life are imprinted on your mind. I know as a psychologist, you know, you can remember everything, what you were doing, what you were wearing, how it smelled, who you were with, everything. And I was cooking tea and the phone rang and it was a GP receptionist and she said, I've been told to ring you to recall you for a, a blood test. And I knew that that's what she was telling me. And I said, do you realise what you've just told me? And she said, yeah, you've got to come in for another appointment to have another blood test. And I said, no, you've just imploded my life. But she had no idea what she was telling me, obviously. <coughs> So you then went for the second appointment with the GP um, who did the, the further test. Um, what, what was the GP's uh, attitude or, or, or response towards you at this stage? His demeanour was very different by then. Um, actually quite apologetic. And, I mean, it, in some ways it was bittersweet because they'd almost been telling me that I was losing my mind. I mean, I'd all been told, this is in your head and you're depressed, and we can give you antidepressants for what ails you. And after four years, I mean, I'm a pretty strong-minded person, as I'm sure you can tell, and, but even after four years, I was starting to doubt myself. I was starting to think, am I imagining this? You know, is it in my head? If, if a, every doctor and every test is telling you that you're wrong, it's very difficult to hold out an opposing opinion. So f to finally be validated in, in, in some ways was a relief. But on the other hand, I'd rather have been wrong. Uh, but he was, he was quite apologetic and he sort of said, you know, the NHS has given you this and what can I say? He said, you know, we owe you to now do whatever it takes to get you through this. He said, but I'm not a hepatologist. So he said, you know, there's very little information I can give you because he said, I think you're the only person I've ever come across with this disease since I left training college. And he gave me a handful of leaflets which were very non-specific. There wasn't anything in there specifically about hepatitis C. Um, and he said, but if this next test comes back positive, which I knew it would, and so did he, he said, I'll refer you straight away to a hepatologist and it's when you get there, you can have all your questions answered because he's the specialist, I'm not. Um, so you were referred by the GP once the test had come back yeah. um, to a hepatologist. 
when you saw that consultant, um, what was the information and advice that was given to you and did you consider it to be adequate? So I was in Bradford at the time and uh, I went to see a consultant, Dr. Morea. Um, we had private health care through my husband's business. So we fast-tracked an appointment because these weeks and weeks of waiting for results to come back, I didn't really want to keep waiting. I wanted to know how far the disease had progressed. Was I in the same boat as Anita Roddick? Was I already cirrhotic? You know, she died within a year of announcing her condition. And so I didn't want to wait any more weeks. So we fast-tracked and we went to see Dr. Maria at the private hospital, although he had a practice at Bradford Royal Infirmary as well. And of course, between seeing my GP and knowing I was going to get in front of the hepatologist, I had a list of questions, as you do. I'd Googled it. I, you know, there was a lot of horror stories out there. And I, I wanted to know a lot of things. So we went along with a list of questions written out, as you do. And um, that was my first experience of how treatment for this disease could be and how you could be treated because it wasn't great. Uh, I sat opposite him with my husband at the time and we st he, he launched into his script and I took him off script to ask him questions. And he every time I asked a question, he'd just say, you don't need to know that yet or you don't need to know that now. And as I was talking to him, he was addressing my husband. And eventually my husband said, don't talk to me, talk to her. And he did. But he was very uncomfortable with me asking all these questions. I got the feeling he felt I was challenging somehow. And I just said, look, I'm in the knowledge business. I get paid two, for two things, time, my time and my knowledge. I'm in the training game. So if I'm presented with a problem, the way I deal with it is to learn as much about it as possible and become my own best expert. That way I can control the uncontrollable. And he really wasn't comfortable being asked a lot of questions and he, he kind of regarded it as that I was almost challenging his expertise and he said look I treat hundreds of patients every year this is what I do just you know he didn't say do as you're told but the inference was you know go along with it do as you're told do the treatment it'll be fine trust me I'm a doctor yeah well I'd done that once before so I was in this mess so it, it wasn't great, and it, I didn't get the information that I wanted, but he referred me at that appointment for a liver biopsy because that was the only way we were going to know the state of my liver. Because we, we were going privately, that biopsy happened quite quickly. Um, not the pleasant, most pleasant experience I've ever had. Um, and I had to wait about 10 days to find out the result of that biopsy. And, I, and he braced me for the fact that I had genotype 1, which is the worst strain of hepatitis C you can have. It's the most resistant to treatment. It was the most aggressive. I'd had it for 22 years. Um, I'd been a social drinker, uh, which doesn't help if you've hep C, but obviously we didn't know that. So he, he kind of was bracing me for the fact that there was every likelihood I was going to be cirrhotic. Um, and he also, at that appointment, said I'd have to get my family tested, my husband, my children. Uh, we went back for the results of the biopsy, and it turned out I was stage 2 fibrosis. I didn't have cirrhosis, so I dodged that bullet, uh, and that was a huge relief. But the next hurdle then was to get the children tested. And you said that having to make those calls and those conversations with your children and having to wait for their results was, was an awful experience, although thankfully they were clear. Yeah, my, my eldest boy had just left university, I was just about to leave university, and I had to ring him and tell him. Until this point, I hadn't had that conversation with my children or the rest of my wider family because until I knew more, I wasn't going to go there. He went and got tested and rang me and said he was fine. I was more worried about my youngest son because my older boy had been born, obviously, before the transfusion. I had breastfed him 
but I'd done my research and found that, you know, I couldn't pass this virus on in the uterus and I couldn't pass it on through breast milk, but there was a chance that you can pass it on at point of birth. So I was more concerned for my younger boy because he'd been born almost four years later. So I had to sit him down and have a conversation with him. He was doing his A-levels at the time. He took it, like most teenagers, remarkably well. Just said, if I've got it, does that mean I don't have to go to school? <laughs> I said, no, you don't get out of it that easy. <laughs> so um, I went with him to the GP. At that point, the GP didn't mess about. I said, we're not doing the whole antibody test, then wait two weeks, just do the PCR test straight away, and he did. Um, and when we were waiting for my youngest son's results to come back, I was doing deals with God saying, let me have the worst case of hep C in the world, but don't infect my children. Sorry. That's all right, Leslie. Uh, and, but your children were not infected. No. You, um, just returning to the consultations you have with Dr. Morea, and I should say that Dr. Morea has provided a statement in response to your criticisms. I don't propose to ask you about it, but for the record, it, it's there, setting out his recollection of, um, of consultations. But you asked Dr. Morea who would be the best treating doctor for you to see. Yes. Uh, and when, that was identified as a Dr. Charles Milson. Yes. When uh, I went back for the results of my uh, biopsy, relations were not improving with Dr. Murray. His, his lack of information was not acceptable for me. And I said, look, you know, I don't think I can go through treatment in your care. And he, he said to me, if you want the best then the best person in this part of the world is Charles Milson, and he's at St. James's Treating Hospital, which was in Leeds. But he said, you're going to find it difficult if you want to transfer, because your funding is with Bradford PCT, as it was then. Um, and he said, obviously, there is no budget for you in Leeds, so if you want to move, I don't know how that's going to be funded. And I said, well, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll worry about that. And then fate kind of played a blinder because one of my family found in the newspaper that this Charles Milton, who I told the family about, said, I'm going to have to track this guy down and see if I can move to, to him. He was doing an event in, in Huddersfield um, at the university, and it was about the liver. And it was to raise awareness of alcoholic hepatitis, really, and, and healthy living and all of that. And they were selling tickets to the public. It, Mainly it was um, medical students that were there, but you, you, you could get tickets to a public gallery. So, of course, I got those, and we rocked up this particular Saturday. And during coffee, I dodged the security and got in front of Charles Milson and said, you don't know me, but you're going to. And um, I told him my story, and he said... He, what swung it was the fact that I got this disease through having a baby and he was very sympathetic to that and he said you know your only crime here is that you had a baby and you've been given this sentence and he said that's not fair and he said absolutely I'll do whatever I can to to get your treatment transferred and he was amazing and he managed to get the funding it was a long fight and it went on quite a while but he got the funding transferred to Leeds and I shifted from Maria's care to Charles Milson. And you, you explained in your statement you did feel that under Dr Milson's care you were given the answers to the questions that you asked, you were given information um, uh, that helped you understand the, the illness and the symptoms and the possible avenues of treatment. Charles Milson was absolutely amazing and because St James's Hospital in Leeds is a teaching hospital, the whole drive of their approach was knowledge and awareness. And quite often when I went to see them, there would be students present. So the fact that I was asking questions and I went with lists of questions was actually a welcome thing, not a downside. So it was like chalk and cheese. It, the way that I was treated at St James's by Milton and his team was the complete antithesis of the way I'd been treated before. And... I knew that that encounter with and moving to Charles Milson, looking back, saved my life. If I'd have been, if I'd have stayed in Bradford, I probably would be dead now.
Now, um, what was the treatment that you underwent and how did it affect you? So I learned quite quickly, and, and, and at this point, I'd been put in touch with the Hepatitis C Trust because there was no information. I, although I could Google it, and there was a lot of scary things out on Google, a lot of it unreliable, and a lot of it from the States, which is very different to, to the UK. Uh, it was Charles Milton, actually, who said, there is the Hep C Trust, and they were in London. Obviously, I was in Yorkshire, but they gave me the number quite early on, and I rang and spoke to Sam May, who was in charge of the hotline there. And um, that saved my sanity um, and put me in touch with a lot of great information. And I learned that there were different genotypes and the treatment for the different genotypes was slightly different, but it all hinged on the same dual therapy, which was interferon injections and ribavirin tablets. It, that was the only treatment. The only difference was if you had genos two and three, you did six months of that. If you had Geno 1, which I did, you'd have to do nearly a year, 48 weeks. So the treatment, the standard treatment from the NHS then was 48 weeks of interferon injections once a week and ribavirin. And I learned the trust was a great source of information and Sam was brilliant. She knew I was a knowledge junkie. So between Sam and Charles Milson, I got so much information to prepare me for what we were going to go through. But interferon is a form of chemotherapy. And so basically it was 48 weeks of, of chemo. It was one shot of interferon a week and then six tablets of ribavirin a day. Um, and it was tough. It was very tough. What were the side effects? If I thought hep C was bad, the treatment was worse. They warned me that any symptoms you'd had of the hep C would be exacerbated by the treatment. So the crashing fatigue, the joint pain was 10 times worse. Um, cluster headaches. Um, I couldn't... I had the, the interferon on a Monday because... Some people work, God knows how people work going through it. but And so they want their weeks clear and then they take the treatment at the weekend. I was the opposite way around. I wanted my weekends with my family to try and be normal. So I took the interferon on the Monday and Tuesday, you could write that off. Tuesday was a bed day. I didn't see daylight the following day. I felt like I'd been hit by a truck. Wednesday, I could kind of move from bed to sofa. Uh, by the middle of the week, I was pottering around. And by the weekend, semi-normal, but I couldn't walk long distances. For the first three months, I carried on working. And then it became apparent I couldn't. I just couldn't. So the, the limited company, I sold it. Um, the guy that was buying it, you couldn't write it. The guy that was buying my company died before the money could transfer through. So I kind of gave the company away. Uh, but the company was wound up. Um, and I just thought, right, OK, I had 48 weeks in my head. I'll do the 48 weeks. We'll get rid of this virus. And then I'll go back to my life. That was the plan. Um, after three or four months, I couldn't function. And the rest of that time was a bit of a haze, really. It was rinse and repeat. Chemo for every Monday. By the middle of the week, function a little. Weekends, potter around have the family around, do Sunday lunch, do whatever, Monday morning, rinse and repeat. And we did that for 48 weeks. The, the ribavirin was really hard on the stomach. So I was ad advised to take quite a lot of fat uh, with the pills to protect the stomach lining. But it gave me really bad gastric problems. Um, I couldn't walk very far. I used to get out of breath. I couldn't do stairs or inclines. Um, yeah, it was pretty tough. And did that course of treatment succeed? No. Um, I was warned that with Geno 1, this standard treatment had a four, around about a 40% success rate. 
uh, which isn't great, but I went into it thinking, yeah, it will work, we'll, we'll crack this. Um, at the end of the 48 weeks, you have to wait six months for all of the chemo and all the medication to leave the system. And then they test again. So at the end of the 48 weeks, they tested and said the virus was undetectable. So we did, I did a very slow lap of honour around the room thinking, we've cracked it. But then you have to wait six months and then they test again. So I was hopeful. And on my birthday, same day as I got the virus, they rang me to tell me it hadn't worked and that the virus was detectable again. Needless to say, I don't celebrate my birthday. That's a bad day for all kinds of reasons. Your reaction was to ask Charles Milsom if you could go through the programme of treatment again. Yes, because when they tested me at my initial diagnosis, my viral load was in the millions, six millions per mil of blood, six million copies of the virus per mil of blood. It was huge. Because I'd had such a big dose of infection, I'd had two litres of contaminated blood. So they could tell that the viral load I'd had at transmission was, was high. By the time we got to the six-month period and found out that the treatment hadn't worked, my viral load was a couple of thousand. It had really dropped down dramatically. So I said to Charles Milson, look, if we do it again, there's every chance, just being a couple of thousand units, that it will, it will eradicate the virus. And he said, I'd love to, but I can't. He said, because this virus mutates. If you've had treatment, it kind of gets a resistance. So if you're a relapser, which is what I was, the virus now is going to respond to the interferon ribavirin even less. You've maybe got less than a 20% chance of success, but 48 weeks costs so much money that nice on a cost per results basis, won't sanction it. I said, well, what do I do? And he said, well, you can wait a year for your viral load to get worse. And in a year, A, you, your body needs time to recover. Because I was, I was absolutely on my knees after that treatment. And he said, you, you, you need a year for your body to recover. Your viral load will have gone up. And if you're sick enough, we might be able to make a case to do it again. He said, but generally, you, you don't get another bite of the cherry. That's your lot. And I said, well, if I don't do anything, what happens now? And he said, well, if you look after yourself, don't drink, eat healthily, whatever. He said, the virus will progress. Um, the prognosis can be cirrhosis of the liver, liver cancer, end-stage liver disease which didn't sound great to me. Um, and, he said, and I said, how long? And he said, well, if you look after yourself, given the, the results we've got in front of us, maybe five years. And that was in 2008. You were told, um, um, however, by Dr. Milson of a drug trial that was going to be undertaken at St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington. Yeah. What's that? Because... St Mary's, uh, because St James's was a uh, teaching hospital and Charles Milson was, was very involved with a lot of uh, research, a lot of d data crossed his desk about research going on, about drug trials around the world. And he said to me, contacted me and said, there's a drug trial that's showing really good initial results it's in its early stages. It's, it's very experimental. But he said, of all of the things I've seen, this one's looking pretty good. But it's at St. Mary's in Paddington. They're going to be running a trial. Um, and they're looking for people with Geno 1, which is the hardest to treat, and people who've had traditional treatment, and it's either they've either non-responded or they've relapsed. And he said, you fall into that category. But he said, the problem you've got is, this is in London, and I was in Yorkshire. Um, but he gave me the number of, of the coordinators for the trial. So I rang them and talked to them. And they were hesitant because they said, normally we don't treat anybody further than a 50-mile radius from the hospital because you have to come here for every injection, uh, every chemo, 
all your medication, even a five-minute blood test, has to be done at the trial centre. You can't have it done locally. And if you get sick, which, you know, people who are non-responders and relapsers who've already done traditional treatment, we're on kind of last chance saloon. And he said, if you get sick and there's every likelihood that the trial drug itself can make you worse, we have to be able to get you in here quickly, which obviously I'm 300 miles away. But again, Charles Milson and his team contacted the people down at St Mary's and made an arrangement with them that they would have a bed ready for me in the liver unit at St Mary at St James's and if anything went wrong they'd get me in there and so between them they facilitated me getting on that drug trial and so you'd go down to London on a weekly basis yeah and that was our next problem because my husband at the time had lost his job um I'd already had to finish work I'd not worked for a year so I had no income he'd lost his job we had no money coming in and suddenly we were faced with the possibility the trial was another year because the trial drug piggybacked the traditional treatment. So interferon and ribavirin for 48 weeks again. And the trial was a double blind. You had a two in three chance of getting the trial drug and a one in three chance of getting a placebo. So one arm of this study were going to get the placebo, but neither the patient nor the treating doctors would know who got the trial drug and who didn't but the way I figured it and I had the conversation with Charles Milton and his team was that because my viral load was so low just in the thousands that if I even got the placebo because I'd get the traditional chemo again that could knock it on the head and nice and the NHS wouldn't let me do that but if I signed up for the trial at the very worst I'd get that and that could do it but if I did nothing I knew I wasn't going to live very long so it seemed like a fairly good gamble to me. But um, we had to start looking at how we were going to fund this. I was in Yorkshire. The trial was in London. I had to go there every week. Train tickets could be £300 return. And if my appointment was early, which meant I had to travel during commuter time, the fares were even higher. So I cashed in every endowment policy, pension, everything I'd saved while I was working in the business, uh, every, everything that we had, I cashed it all in and thought, right, there's a, it, maybe enough money there for us to manage, hoping, of, obviously, that my husband would get a job and we'd be fine. But we, we, we had very few choices, so the family had a meeting and I was going to, you know, my outcome wasn't great if I didn't do it, so we weren't going to let finances get in the way. We did look at any help we could get to fund it but there wasn't any you had friends who would help you out with a place to stay and you've said eventually yeah. the team at St Mary's started to adjust your appointment times to off peak hours to reduce the expenses when they started to realize what we were having to do like they questioned I mean my husband at the time came with me for the first couple of appointments when we started the trial and he was there at meetings where they were discussing the implications of this trial for example you know, you take your care out with the NHS and you give it to the drug company. So they said, you'll have a gap in your medical records. You won't get to know any of the results, blood test results or anything. You, you, you are blind and you have to hand your care over to them. And there were implications to that. I had to make a will. I had to write letters to my children on, on the off chance that, you know, we didn't make it because a lot of people weren't going to make it. Um, so he was present at those first meetings, but... Then when I started going for the treatment, they were saying, well, where's your husband? Well, how come you're on your own? Because obviously I'd have the chemo, I'd have the injections, and then I'd have to get on a train and go home straight after, which in the past, you know, I was fit for nothing. I was in bed, but I had to get on a train and do the journey. So they were saying, have you not got anybody with you? And I said, well, we can't afford two train tickets. We can't afford to stay over in London. We can't afford accommodation. One of us was struggling, never mind two. So they, yes, they changed my appointments so that I could travel off peak, which made the cost less. We had friends in Peterborough at the time. So when it, on t weeks and months when I was really ill and I, I really couldn't do that journey, they'd put me up and then they were just an hour outside of London. So the journey was shorter and I'd go back there after treatment and recover for a few days before 
going and doing it again. Um, what would the, um, the, the physical and psychological effects of the treatment on you? I already knew what the standard treatment would be like, but the big unknown was the trial drug. And it was an unknown to them as well, to the practitioners, because that's the idea of a trial. They had no idea, really, what this would do to a human being. But what they said to me was, and this is the downside of being a trial guinea pig, they wanted to know how bad side effects would get. And so they said, there are no rescue drugs during this trial. When you do traditional treatment, the doctor, my GP, when I did the original treatment, was, was really good and gave me anything I needed to get through. So, uh, you know, painkiller, really strong painkillers, sleeping tablets, cream for rashes, all of that was available. With the trial, they said we, part of the reason we do the trial is to find out how intolerable this drug is on the human body. So we need to know, so you can't have any rescue drugs. The only thing we could have was paracetamol. So they said, you have to keep a, lo a log and a diary of every symptom that you have so that they could see if patterns were emerging with, with the trial candidates and they could see what kind of effect it was going to have. The one thing they did know was that they warned us it would have implications for the skin, the heart. It took its toll on the heart. So before every treatment, every week, I had to have a heart trace to prove that my heart was going to stand up to it for another week. Uh, I heard about other trial patients, which you, you never met them. You, you're kept in an isolated bubble because of the placebo effect. They don't want you speaking to other um, patients going through the trial because they don't want that uh, cross-infection of, of what symptoms are you getting and all of that. But I had heard that some pulled out because their heart trace meant that they, their heart was weakening and they couldn't take another round. So every week I'd have that. But when they sat us down, they said another thing is the psychological effect. And they knew that it could lead to depression and psychological issues. So you had to agree to take prophylactic antidepressants for a month before you started the trial and all the way through the trial. And we also had to keep a log of mood swings uh, and psychological issues. They said you can get a kind of rage. They called it ribavarin rage. Ribavarin can give you that anyway, but the trial drug could exacerbate it. And so they wanted us to keep a log. Now, my husband had been present at those meetings and he obviously he heard that. And, and they said, you know, maybe I'm not the best person to know whether, you know, how my mood is. So my family were asked to keep a record of mood swings and irritability and all of that. Um, and I wanted to minimise that element of it for my family. I didn't want to be snapping and snarling. And, you know, it was bad enough that I was going to be physically so ill. But because I'm a psychotherapist... Um, if you're in practice, you have to have supervision. So you have a senior psychotherapist who monitors your mental health, just doing therapy with other clients. So I went to my supervisor and said, look, I'm going to be going through this. Will you keep this log? And will you see me every week? And you as an expert log this and help me minimize that psychological aspect of it. Now he obviously he's, he's in this for a living, but he kindly said, I understand the, the financial situation you're in, so I will do that free of charge. So I kept a log, my son's kept a log, and I went to see him every week, and he recorded and mapped the psychological impact. It was tough, and it was, I mean, depression goes along with this, because you're so ill, and you know your prognosis isn't great, so... You know, your mental health isn't great. But he kept me going and sane. And I rang Sam and relied on the Hep C Trust helpline and they kept me sane as well. And I know that that aspect of it wasn't that great. I think I came out of it psychologically pretty strong. Physically, it was horrendous because there were no rescue drugs. So 
My toenails fell out. My eyelashes fell out. My hair started to fall out. And for any woman, you know, losing your hair is the one thing that we all worry about. Um, I never lost it completely, but, you know, clumps. I'd wake up in the morning, there'd be clumps on the pillow. My eyelashes would be on the pillow. I lost all my body hair. I got rashes. Uh, my breathing was quite bad. Uh, totally exhausted. Um, stomach problems were really bad. And they, they did say, you know, the rib of Aaron can rip your stomach to pieces, but the trial drug on top was doing its job as well. It, it was a very toxic trial because it was raw. It was one of the first um, trials in man. So it was raw. And uh, I felt as if, you know, we were taking toxic poison, hoping it would kill the virus, but hoping, minimising how much of the good stuff it was killing off at the same time. And you finished that trial at the beginning of 2010. And in July 2010, you, you got the results. They rang me and said, uh, you did get the trial drug, it did work, and you're virus-free. You, you have been left with some physical health issues as a result of the virus uh, and or of the treatment. You've been left with a hiatus hernia, you suffer from gastroenteritis, um, esophagitis. Are, are there other, is there another physical residue of the... Yeah, my stomach is never going to be the same. My digestive system is, is compromised. I'll be on medication for the rest of my life for that. I, I'm limited to what I can eat and what I can drink. Um, one of the worst things I've been left with is fibromyalgia. Um, so the, the crippling joint pain that I had um, with the treatment is now... I'm not free of that because the fibromyalgia has now taken that over. So the symptoms of that are crippling joint pain in my feet, knees, hands, my neck. Um, chronic fatigue goes with it. Um, I can't... The corporate work I used to do and the, the training company that I used to run, I've had to cut that back more or less completely. I can't do those sort of days anymore. I can't run that kind of punishing schedule anymore. Um, and if I try and I do it, there's a payback and it can take me days to recover from that. And my family that I live with now have to bear the brunt of the fact that a lot of what we used to do, walking, we used to do a lot of hill walking, we've got a dog, we used to enjoy walking the moors and, and I can't do that. Uh, and so I'm compromised in that. My heart was affected, um, probably by the trial, but there's a hole in my medical record, so who knows. But because I had to have the heart traces, I knew that could be a factor. And I've since been diagnosed with um, ventricle um, regurgitation and my left valve, heart valve, is weakened. I've got arrhythmia. I've got high blood pressure. Uh, so, yeah, I've been left with quite a few things to deal with. And over the years, in the, of the period when, from when you first discovered you had hepatitis C, how has that infection impacted upon medical treatment and care that you've received? Um, I found out with the work that I did with the Trust, I ended up actually being employed by the Trust um, because I'd done quite a lot of, we'd had quite a lot of dialogue and they realised what I did for a living and I ended up working with them. But I talking to people that I then encountered through the trust and the work I did with them, I knew that you didn't have to declare your status. Now, I'd cleared the virus, but I knew that if people medically, like dentists, chiropodists, if they knew you'd had it, it compromised the way that you were treated or whether you were treated at all because of the fear and the stigma that surrounds it. So I was very careful. Um, I did tell my dentist, but they were great. It didn't compromise the way I was treated there. Um, but to this day, even though I've eradicated the virus, I'm antibody positive. So if my blood is tested, 
the antibody for hepatitis C shows up, just like if you've had mumps or measles, you've got an antibody against it. So you always carry that antibody positive, but I have no live virus, so I'm not infectious to anybody. I can't, you know, my blood is safe. But to this day, if I go into hospital for a procedure, the minute they see that on my records, I'm treated differently. So we've had examples where I've been called in for a routine surgery and they've said, especially for the stomach, so I have, you know, um, procedures for my stomach. They'll call me in and say, you're going down at seven in the morning, nil by mouth from midnight. And then they, the anaesthetist will come and sit down and say, well, it says antibody positive here for hep C. And I have to explain, I have to explain to them, I'm not infectious. It doesn't make any difference. My blood is safe. But suddenly I see people coming in that are due down into theatre after me and they go before me. And... Um, we had an incident where I was called in at seven in the morning for a procedure and I was still there at nine at night because what they do is they leave you to the end of the list so that everybody else goes in first. And the reason they leave you to the end of the list is they sterilise the theatre. They, they virtually fumigate the place after you because you're like a plague victim. And I've said to them, universal hygiene procedures should be in place because... A lot of people have got blood-borne viruses who don't know they have them. For 22 years, I had hep C, and I had babies, I had procedures, I had an hysterectomy. I didn't know that I had the virus, and I was just put in the theatre like everybody else. If you're operating universal hygiene procedures, it shouldn't make any difference. You should treat everybody as if they may have something, but they don't. They put you to the end of the list. And, I, and knowing that is humiliating. Can I ask you about other experiences you've had in relation to stigma and, the, and, and reaction? You've, um, you, you had a reaction uh, with a client that you've described in your statement. Yeah, for the first, when I did the first round of treatment, which was unsuccessful, for the first three or four months, I carried on working. And I had a client who was, uh, it was a factory. And so there was the management and uh, the office staff, and then there were the guys down on the factory floor. And I did training with both senior management and office staff and guys down on the factory floor. And I'd had this client for quite a lot of a number of years, and the, the management team knew me very well. They were, they were like friends. When I got diagnosed, I told them about my diagnosis, and I said, you know, don't make it public, but it's so that you understand in the first few months... I'm going to have to see how I go and whether I can carry on working. But if I'm tired or if I get a hospital appointment, we might have to work around that. And they were great. And they said, yeah, that's fine. And they said, you know, they'd keep it, uh, they'd keep the, the knowledge of my status private. But word got out somehow. And I turned up to do a job at the factory this particular day. And we were in a room, not unlike this, with about as many people. And the union rep, stood up and said, we've heard that you've got hepatitis C and none of us want you here. Um, and they said, you know, we've got a communal kitchen. We don't want you using our kitchen. We don't want you using our cups and saucers. We don't want you using our toilets. Um, and in that moment, you know, do you want to try and educate a room full of people about the fact that, you, you know, you're not... You're not contagious unless it's blood-to-blood -blood transmission. I was, I was only just going through treatment myself. I knew my blood was risky, but, you know, you could use cups and saucers. And, but it was so bad, they refused to work with me, and that contract ended because of that. And you had not dissimilar reactions in your circles of friends and acquaintances. Yeah, we lost, we lost friends because of it. People were so frightened when they found out about the hepatitis C because middle England, you know, middle class white people in middle England didn't know a, a great deal about this disease. They thought it was a drug user's disease. So the first thing is you have the humiliation of having to explain to your friends you've never used drugs. This isn't because you dabbled in drugs back in the day or at university or any of that, that you've got this through a blood transfusion. So that dialogue in and of itself is not comfortable but I found myself having to try and educate my peer group because they didn't know anything about it. And they were saying, well, surely there's a vaccination against it. Surely 
And the more that they looked into it, the only thing they could liken it to that they'd come across before was HIV. Because although it's not the same as HIV, it is very similar. And knowing that, some people were just so frightened. You know, you could see the fear in them. And so invitations to events started to drop off. People didn't feel comfortable sharing cups and plates. We went to a dinner party and the host knew about my condition and one or two other guests, but not everybody. It's not something you shout about. And I was going through treatment at the time. And at the end of the meal, they were passing the plates down the table and a woman said, who I'd, I'd only met that night, and she said, I don't think your cups and saucers and crockery should go in the dishwasher with ours. And the people in the room who didn't know what that was about suddenly asked, and you're there first with that. So people wouldn't come to dinner parties if they knew we were there, so we stopped going. You stayed overnight once with some friends, and uh, you were later told by others that they'd burnt the sheets after you left. Can I ask you, Leslie, about the impact upon your family? You shielded um, your children, you felt, to some extent, because you decided not to tell your younger son's school and your eldest son was at university by then. What about your parents, though, your mother? My father passed away three years before I got diagnosed, so he never knew. We can take what you've said in your statement as read and not go into it if you prefer in relation no, to your mother. No, I think it's important that people know the impact that this has. Would you like me to read that bit of your statement? Yes, please. So you've described this. This was in relation to your, to your mother. So your mother was still alive and in her 80s when you were diagnosed. During the time you were diagnosed, she was living at home and had carers four times a day. I would go in regularly and do the other things the carers would not do. She'd worked for the police as a police matron, so she knew what HCV was, and her younger brother had died of liver cancer a few years before, though this was not connected to HCV. When I told her my diagnosis, my mother looked me in the eye and told me that dying of liver disease was the most horrible way to go. She said she wouldn't want her grandson to see that and told me the best thing I could do for myself and my children was to kill myself. She said, my husband, my soulmate and best friend, would not want to live with me like this, but he did not sign up for it and he would leave me. And that was my mother. I couldn't believe it. Leslie, there was also uh, an impact on your marriage. Again, I can take that from your statement if it would help. Yeah. So you've explained how the impact of the infection destroyed your marriage... Your husband had supported you through the first round of treatment and through the second round of treatment, through the all clear. And then you've said this. In October 2011, he got up, told me he loved me, kissed me goodbye and went to work. He never came back home after that day. I never saw him again except in court when he sued for divorce. And then he, he told you this. He said the treatment and the drug trial had been too much for him, that he'd turned into a carer and not a husband, that he'd cleaned up my vomit and nursed me, and that he no longer saw me as a lover and a wife, but as a disease. The impact on your career and your work, you've already told us about. You had to sell your company. You found work that you've, you've mentioned with the Hepatitis C Trust. What can you tell us about that? So, in the early days, when I rang Sam and was in touch with the helpline, we got chatting about what I did and the job. And um, World Hepatitis Day came around during my first round of treatment. And they were struggling to get people to stick their head above the parapet and talk about their condition because there's a stigma attached to it. So a lot of people, if they're in employment, they may not want their employer to know. If they've got young children at school, because of the stigma, we'd heard horror stories about people finding out that somebody had, parents had hep C and they wouldn't let their children play with their children in the playground and all of that. So people, understandably, didn't want to come out and, and do, be public about it. 
so when World Hepatitis Day came around, uh, I was chatting to Sam and they were saying, you know, we want people who will do media work, who will speak to the press, who will try and raise awareness to try and get people to go and be tested. And my story was quite useful because the, we knew that there was whole cohorts of people who would be walking around with this virus who didn't know that they had it, who'd never done drugs, who thought that hep C, like HIV, wasn't their problem. And we needed to raise awareness so that people, anybody who'd had surgery or childbirth in the 80s who may have had blood would go and get tested. And so my story was quite useful for that because I could stand there and say, you know, this is not just a drug user's disease. This is um, everybody's problem. And if you've had surgery or you've had blood, blood product, you need to get tested. So we talked about that. And in the first World Hepatitis Day, I did a lot of media work. So I was interviewed on TV both locally and nationally, um, Sky News, local newspapers and so on. And it, it raised a lot of awareness and, and proved quite useful. And from that, we entered into dialogue and I was chatting to Charles Gore, who was the chief exec of, of the Hep C Trust at the time. And he was really interested in the training that I was doing in the training company. And so all through my treatment, I would, I would pop up and do vol volunteer work, uh, raising awareness and so on. And then um, Charles contacted me and said that they might be able to get hold of some funding. And this was towards the end of the drug trial, 2010, and said, you know, if they could get some funding, they might be able to create a role within the trust. And one of the things we talked about was the fact that the trust, as a charity, they got virtually no core funding. It was all done with donations, and they were surviving on fresh air, really. But one of the things that they were doing was um, they were being approached by organisations like needle exchanges, uh, drug rehab centres, shelters for the homeless, where the pool of infection and risky behaviours was huge and, and was a real problem of infection. And they were approaching the trust as the, as the leading experts in this field to go and give talks to their staff about how to do harm reduction with their clientele. So in needle exchanges, drug users were coming in to get clean needles. They knew enough to get clean needles, but they were getting infected because they were sharing filters, water, and that kind of thing. So needle exchanges wanted advice on how to educate their clientele. And they were coming to the trust for that because they were the acknowledged experts. And the trust were going along and giving these talks free of charge on a kind of an ad hoc basis. And I was saying to, to Charles uh, and Sam that that was something they could charge for because all of these organisations had funding for training and the trust had no money. So if you're getting approached for your expertise, charge for it because then the trust is getting an income and the services are getting a, a quality product that they can get funding for. So it's a win-win. Um, so the upshot was that when I finished the trial, I was very ill and I was waiting for the six months to find out if it had been successful or not. And during that time, their funding came through and I got a job with them as training and development manager. And so to try and generate some income for the trust, we came up with a list of courses we could run. I designed the courses came up with a charging structure for it, which was competitive. It wasn't the sort of corporate rates you'd pay for training, but it was within what I knew the funding would be for these uh, different agencies. So we came up with a, a pricing structure. We wrote the courses, designed them, sold them, uh, and delivered them. And so I did that. Um, and it got wider. I mean, word got around as to what we were doing and suddenly we were going into we were approached by the Royal College of GPs to write a, a course for GPs about this because as my GP had said to me I'm not a specialist in this you know I'm a general practitioner I'm not a specialist and so we wrote modules to be trained to GPs about about the disease about the stigma about creating a, a better patient pathway um, You've also said that in, in your statement that, that this particular training for the Royal College of General Practitioners included training on how to improve the patient experience 
in matters such as the news, the diagnosis being communicated, not by a receptionist accidentally. As exactly. And, and the horror stories that Sam used to get, I mean, she, Sam ran the helpline, so she was hearing daily. We, we were drawing out themes that the news wasn't broken well. People, you know, receptionists, as in my case, were inadvertently giving you the news. They, don't, they didn't realise the impact of what they were saying. So we did courses on how to break that news, how to deal with the response from the patient. I mean, everybody, as a psychologist, I know everybody responds differently. Some people cry, some people get angry, some people more dangerously do nothing and just walk out of the room. So we, we were training that. And then a lot of research came in about the prisons. And there was a huge pool of infection in the prison system because most of the people that were going in there had done drugs, either just before going into prison or even while they were in prison. And so risky behaviours and blood-to-blood uh, -blood transmission of, of blood-borne viruses was, was a big issue in the prison system. And nobody was going in there. Uh, and we, we asked the question, you know, why, why is nobody going in there to raise awareness among the po prison population about their own risky behaviours, to minimise risks to them? And more importantly, to uh, educate prison staff about the dangers. And if they did have patients, prisoners, going through treatment, I'd done treatment, laying in a comfortable bed with endless cups of tea being brought up, you know, at the ring of a bell almost. What on earth must it be like to do that treatment, that brutal treatment, in prison and be locked in a cell during the night without access to a drink if you needed it or pain relief if you needed it? I couldn't imagine what that must be like. And eventually, we, nobody was going in there because it was a very difficult environment to get into. But I was lucky enough to meet at one of the teaching hospitals that I went to, as part of the job, I went round every liver unit in just about every hospital in England. Um, and we had funding for leaflets to be printed because there was no information for people. One of the things that, that struck me when I got diagnosed was a friend of mine, she got breast cancer at the same time, more or less, that I got diagnosed with my disease. And the disparity between how somebody with a diagnosis of cancer, which is terrible and life-changing, just the same as a hep C diagnosis or an HIV diagnosis is, the pathway that she had was very different and a very different experience to mine. So straight away, she was signposted to Macmillan with all the access that that gives to financial assistance, wigs, um, counselling, care to get you through it. For us, there was nothing. So the trust managed to get some funding, goodness knows from where, to get leaflets printed. And my job, one of my jobs, was to go around all the teaching hospitals, all the treating hospitals in, the, in England, and talk to hepatologists and say to them and their nursing teams that when somebody comes to you with a diagnosis of hep C and as they're getting put on treatment, can you give them this pack of leaflets which points them to the Hep C Trust Helpline, which I'd found out by accident existed. You know, who, who knew there was such a thing? So it gave them access to that. It signposted them to help they could get, treatment they could get, funding they could apply for, um, complementary therapies, all of that. So we put this pack together and we made sure that anybody that went into a hepatology department with this diagnosis was signposted with something it was little enough, it wasn't anything like the resources that somebody like Macmillan has, but it was better than nothing. And um, so we were going in and doing all of that, and I met a nurse at Manchester Hospital when I did that who said, I go into Strangeways Prison twice a week to deal with the prisoners that are going through treatment. Would you come in and give a talk to the staff? Hallelujah. So we got in to the prison service and once we got into strange ways, it blossomed from there. So we were getting invitations to go into other prisons around the country. Not as many as we would have liked. But the treatment pathway for prisoners changed. And I'm really proud of the work we did because it made 
one of the things that they were telling me was because the treatment is so tough, and I knew that, and because a prisoner going through treatment has it even worse because they don't have access to all the home comforts we, we would, a lot of them drop out. They give up on it because it's too tough and they can't work. A lot of them weren't given tickets to have time off work. So if they wouldn't get out of their cell to go and do the job, because they work when they're in prison, they were busted down to basic, which means they don't get a TV in their room. They have that taken away. They have their privileges removed because they can't work. And that was a ridiculous situation. Not in all prisons, but it was happening. So a lot of prisoners were dropping out of treatment. And I know from my experience that if you give up on treatment, you're wasting your best shot then when it was traditional uh, chemo, which it's not now, but it was then, because the virus will mutate against it. And if you ever decide to go back on it again, you've even less chance of survival. So to keep them on it was key. And we did a lot of work which improved their experience. We educated the prison system and the staff about what this meant for these people and the best way to keep them on treatment. And so their survival rate was going up. Their success rate of getting people successfully through treatment improved greatly. We gave them things like we managed, not in all prisons, but in some of the prisons, we managed to get an agreement with the governor to get a phone line to the Hep C Trust so that prisoners could ring the Hep C Trust and get counselling and support. We did a training system where we trained mentors, Hep C and HIV mentors within prisons, fellow prisoners who had privileged knowledge that certain other prisoners were going through this treatment and could go into their cell and buddy them if they were having a hard time. If you get depressed and suicidal on this treatment, when you're sitting at home. Can you imagine getting depressed and suicidal on this treatment in a category of prison where you don't want your fellow prisoners to know your status because you'll become a pariah because of the stigma? You know, if people burnt the sheets if I stayed the night or wouldn't put their crockery in the dishwasher when I'd been for dinner, can you imagine a prisoner going down to recreation with fellow prisoners knowing their status and being terrified of that stigma? and the brutality and the, and the isolation that they felt. And that led into suicide rates within prison, which are bad enough as it is without that added element. So we did a huge amount of work in there, which I'm very proud of, and it changed the quality of care. And in some prisons, they get gold standard care, you know. Leslie, those are the questions <coughs> I had for you. Um, is there anything further you would like to say? If I may, I've written something. Is that okay? <coughs> Apologies if I get emotional. I'll try not to. 34 years ago, I was unknowingly thrown into a lifelong battle that I never wanted to fight. It was started by governments taking decisions I wasn't involved in or consulted on. And like most battles, it was ordinary people who were left to fight it. Some might find the analogy strange, but when you're fighting for your life, make no mistake, that's what it is. Men, women and children found themselves dropped into a war zone they couldn't yet imagine in their worst nightmares, and for which they were totally unprepared and ill-equipped. The true number of those in this deadly arena may never be fully known, the death toll currently stands around 2,800, but that number increases every day. Those forced into this nightmare have for decades fought against silent killers like hepatitis C and HIV. Stealthy enemies who give no quarter, don't fight fairly and don't play by the rules. There were no allies for us. No reinforcements came over the hill to save the day. No recognition. Medals for valour or reparation for sacrifices made and losses taken. This was a lonely struggle, covered with a blanket of denial by successive governments who didn't want the mistakes that led to this disaster made public. In the best tradition of state secrets, they didn't want to acknowledge the battles or publicise the losses. All victims have suffered the destruction of hopes and dreams 
Lives changed forever. Families torn apart. The disaster has left widows and orphans in its wake. Imposed crippling financial and economic costs on those involved. And it still isn't over as this insidious enemy considers, continues to take the lives of those left at the rate of one every four days. Many have been felt stigmatised, betrayed and abandoned. Those left carry deep wounds, both physical and emotional. And for too many, those wounds have proved fatal. We live with constant pain and shortened lifespans. Every checkup, screening and scan brings the possibility of increased risk of cancer, liver disease, heart problems and infections that can prove fatal to us because of compromised immunity. Human beings can endure the unthinkable. They can survive the unimaginable as long as they have hope. Hopelessness is the one thing certain to crush the human spirit. The victims of the greatest treatment disaster in the history of the NHS have always held on to hope in the face of overwhelming odds. For many of us, there have been times when we were crippled by despair. People have died, clinging on to the hope that one day their suffering and the suffering of their loved ones would be recognised and acknowledged. People worked all of their lives to provide a secure future for themselves and their families, a security that was devastated by a wrecking ball that crashed through our lives and ripped it all away. Security of a life without ill health. Security of a comfortable and peaceful old age. All gone. This inquiry has the power to restore hope. That the incalculable losses can finally be addressed. And justice can go some way to restoring the security that we were all robbed of through no fault of our own. A life of ill health is a life half lived. I thank Theresa May for making this inquiry possible and for the opportunity to add my testimony as a witness to the UK's biggest peacetime disaster. But it's only worth anything if this makes a difference. So my plea is to Sir Brian and the inquiry to make sure that hope isn't lost and that justice can finally be given to those affected. Firstly, thank you. Mr Locke, who represents you, has just asked me to raise one final matter on a note of hope. You've explained how your, uh, your business, your employment, your work was uh, affected and damaged uh, by your illness and by the treatment that you underwent for it. And so you've had to look for new challenges and new ways of, um, new areas of focus. And you've done that most recently by writing... <coughs> A book which is about to be published, is that right? Yes, my, my book was published on the 7th of May. Um, it's a, a crime thriller, not anything to do with hep C. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. There is one question which I want to ask you, but uh, it uh, requires me first to ask a number of matters of Miss Richards, if, if I may. Um, those who were listening closely to what uh, was said at the start of uh, Leslie's testimony uh, may have put two and two together uh, and they may have inferred the following. If the blood was red blood, uh, as seems likely given the need to restore haemoglobin and given the rise in haemoglobin after uh, it was given as the letter which you displayed showed, then uh, if it was properly said to be heat treated, um, would that be consistent with anything which the inquiry understands about the treatment supplied to red blood? It would not, sir. Because red blood, in our understanding currently, uh, was not and could not be heat treated. Sir, yes, that's, and indeed, sir, this issue arose tangentially in, in the course of the witness's evidence yesterday. So, it, those listening closely might 
come to the conclusion that because Miss McAvoy was making a bit of a fuss about uh, having blood, which they thought might very well be safe, or may have assumed was safe, that they should tell her it was heat-treated and safe. So, yes, that is one inference that, that may be drawn from the evidence. Uh, and that uh, the doctor concerned uh, went so far as to stick on a label. I note that Miss McAvoy recalls the label as having been stuck on and not part of the original label from the, the centre. Uh, then um, that was in order to reassure her on one view or to mislead her on another. So, yes. Has uh, any uh, echo of that suggestion been put to the hospital concerned? It has not. Um, uh, I don't know without checking whether the hospital concern still exists. No, I rather suspect it doesn't. It was a local maternity hospital. Uh, the successor health authority will need to be it will. told that that is a, a possible inference which I, I might draw. <coughs> Uh, and let me now ask my, my question. If you uh, had known uh, at the time, first, that the blood had not been heat treated and could not be, but second, had no clue then, because you hadn't yet suffered uh, as you plainly have over the years since, uh, that you might be unfortunate enough to contract a, a virus which would have those effects. Do you think that ultimately you would have had transfusion or not? Your best evidence, please. If I had known that it wasn't heat treated and that my fears about HIV couldn't be allayed, I probably would have fought on not to have the blood. However, because my haemoglobin was so low, I was teetering on the edge of, of potentially having a heart attack and dying anyway. What would I have done, if I'm honest? I probably would have asked to be moved from the maternity unit so I wasn't a bed blocker and maybe transferred to another unit. And I probably would have held out because I was so concerned about the HIV had it not had they not said to me we can guarantee it's been heat treated and it's safe I probably would have held out and I would probably have looked for alternatives such as my father giving one pint one pint being better than nothing and having that I, I probably would have held out so it, it uh, would follow that if uh, and I, I, I must bear in mind I, I'm making no conclusion uh, about this. I have not heard uh, what may be said uh, by the hospital. But if it turned out uh, that the stickers were put on the bag for whatever reason, uh, saying something which is not true uh, about the nature of the blood inside, it is that which has led to the misery you have suffered since. So that's a comment from me. But it's uh, open, ob obviously, to argument and inference, and in due course, I'd want to know what the Hospital Trust has to say about it. Yes, sir. Uh, I emphasise, for those who are listening, uh, I'm drawing no final conclusion. Can I thank you very much uh, for coming to give uh, your evidence? It, it has taken, uh, although you're used to talking about it, plainly considerable courage. You've told us uh, how presenting for a a day or an occasion can wreck you for a day or two, I hope, uh, that uh, it doesn't, but plainly you're taking the risk of that. So thank you very much indeed for, for coming uh, to give us and, and tell us what you've said. Thank you. minutes past 12. Uh, we'll take a break. Um, I I'm told uh, that at the moment the next witness, uh, who I know had travel difficulties earlier on today, uh, has not yet uh, arrived. I, I think from the signals I'm getting from Miss Jones in the front row, 10 minutes away. 10 minutes away, right. 
In that case, we'll take a break now for half an hour. Uh, so um, let's make it 20 to 1, if you please. Those who are accustomed to lunch at 1 o'clock, it'll be a little bit late because we have to hear the, the, the next witness. Uh, 20 to 12, please. 20 to 1, sir. 20 to 1. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. <laughs>